Alrighty. So, my talk today is on web governance. Uh, my name is Michael Worf. I'm the web manager for a small university in Canada, uh, the University of Lethbridge. Uh, we're a relatively young university. We're celebrating 45th year uh, this year, so it's a big deal for us, 1967. Um, and basically, uh, like I mentioned, I flew in from Canada uh, for this talk and to attend Drupal, Drupal Camp LA, and I've been uh, quite excited about the particular sessions that I've been in. Um, but it's a bit of a distance. It's 23 hours to drive home if I wanted to do so, so planes are good things. Um, but if I speak with a bit of an accent or if I accidentally use the metric system, it's because I'm from a different country. Please give me some grace. All right, so a little bit of background. Uh, the University of Lethbridge is uh, where I manage the web, as I mentioned. This is uh, a building designed by Arthur Erickson. This is our main campus. This is U-Haul. We are built, our entire uh, campus is built into the side of a hill. So um, our landscape is very different than yours. And I have uh, deer and pheasant and those types of things outside my office window all day. And it's kind of a, a bit of a culture shock to see palm trees and things, but it's, it's cool. A um, bit, bit of our campus, just to give you some context, we have uh, about 9,000 students uh, between grad studies. Uh, we're a comprehensive university, so we have uh, management, fine arts, education, uh, school of grad studies. Research is a big focus. The Center for Neuroscience, Brain and Behavior is in Lethbridge, Alberta. We're also active in GIS and water research. Um, just to give you some some flavor for what we do. I understand in the US you guys love college athletics So I threw in a shot of our pronghorns hockey team We're pretty apathetic uh, But that's a culture thing too. Uh, I mentioned about research uh, We also have a digital audio arts program that's been taken off like wildfire and some health sciences So it gives you an idea of who we are in uh, 2000, 2008 um, my web team started up Drupal Camp Alberta. So Drupal Camp is not new to us, and certainly it's something that has grown from a grassroots uh, Drupal Camp, which it still is, but it's on a much larger scale now. It's grown out of Lethbridge and into a larger center in our province, um, sponsored by another university. And we, um, we are the central Drupal source uh, for, for the province, coming up in September if you're ever around. Uh, this is our web presence. Uh, the University of Lethbridge has an internal web team of five designers and developers. We also have a digital signage coordinator. Um, we do everything internally. We don't deal a lot with um, third parties or contractors, and that's something that I want to talk about in the governance discussion, is how do, you, how do you collaborate and ensure quality, and how can you deal with bottlenecks when you have an internal team of a fixed size, and you're dealing with budget constraints and time constraints as well. Um, this is obviously built on Drupal. We have 92 Drupal installations on the campus. Um, so it's one of those, or two of those 92, are obviously Drupal multi-site. So that expands, that number expands greatly when you think about a multi-site configuration. Um, but one of the things we're working to right now is this is the site as its current state. We're moving to a responsive design. Uh, theme and Drupal 7. The majority of our stuff is Drupal 6 right now, um, and that's really it from the technical end. So I want to talk about web governance. So does any of these uh, scenarios sound familiar? In your organization, I should find out who, who's here. Um, are you here from other schools? Are you here from enterprise? Show of hands if you're an academic person. No? A couple? Yeah? Okay. Uh, enterprise? Large scale? Yeah? Lots of departments, one big... Yeah, gotcha. Um, and then any sort of other classification that I've missed? Any major? No? Museum. Museum? Okay, so would you call that nonprofit or for profit? Arts no. management? Nonprofit science center. Gotcha. Formal education. Gotcha, very good. Was there another? Yeah? Right. Wow, that's culture shock, isn't it? I, uh, before I came to the University of Lethbridge, I was the creative director for an ad agency in another city. And I had only worked in, um, 
well, I had worked in, in telecom for a long time, and I'd worked in ad agencies. And coming to academia when you're not from academia is a bizarre, bizarre experience where things are not profit-driven, and people love to debate because that's what they get paid to do all day, and everyone has an opinion about every part of practice. It's a wonderful, chaotic uh, experience, and I love it. I've been there now six years. Um, but when we look at governance, we say, you know, okay, so what the heck is this topic of web governance? And so does any of these scenarios sound familiar? Um, internal stakeholders fighting about who makes decisions over website or intranet. You know, corporate web team wants the web to get better, and they have an understanding of how to do so, but they have no power, no money, no staff. Um, you know, you've gone and redesigned the site, you've tried social, you've implemented more sophisticated infrastructure, the site's getting bigger, but it's not necessarily getting better. And so the idea of web governance attempts to stop internal debates about website ownership and it defines budgeting and resourcing and, and adequately uh, funding a web team, uh, realizing the opportunity mitigating the risk of operating online and manages the entire big picture from a corporate web effort, you know, what is getting done centrally and what is outsourced. So I guess in short, uh, my colleague Mark Greenfield from the University of Buffalo says web governance is simply deciding on who gets to decide about stuff. That's what it, that's what it boils down to. So if you follow web governance as a practice, uh, one of the thought leaders is someone named Lisa Welshman. And if you check out her website, welshmanpeerpoint.com, I'll put it in the notes. I'll, I'll put these slides up as well. Um, Welshman Peerpoint, she deals with... Uh, governance from a government education and enterprise sector, but she's gone ahead and realized that govern governance starts at least grassroots. It starts at the, at the symptoms of the problems within corporations and schools and things being, you know, um, I can't, I don't have the resources to get something done or I don't have an idea of project priority or is this on message on brand or is what I'm working on um, even strategically aligned to the business? You know, that stuff, these questions happen from the bottom up. Executives assume a lot of the time that web teams are resourced and equipped adequately unless they hear otherwise and really need to be involved in those conversations. So Lisa, Lisa Welshman has put out an ebook called The Digital Deca and it's done a little tongue in cheek. It's done like a children's storybook. But what it is, it's a uh, 10 management truths for the, for the web age and is sort of a an unvarnished look at maybe from the executive's point of view, things you need to accept in order for your website to get better. So I, I just put a couple uh, segments from the book here, uh, but basically it starts out with this character, Wendell Wallace Webb. And Wendell Wallace Webb is the voice of your organization and he talks online nonstop 24 seven globally, whether you like it or not. And Wendell Wallace Webb has some symptoms of a lack of governance and that is bad search, multiple logins for applications, um, liability of content, content silos, poorly integrated data, and multiple um, graphic designs. And what she means by the multiple graphic designs is, you know, uh, non-compliance or ad-libbing with brand messages, you know, one department versus another, not looking at a cohesive experience. And so she comes to say that, you know, for management to accept that uh, governance is something that uh, is of value or has a return. There's a couple truths here that I'd like to expand upon. And truth number one just says, you know, your web presence is the digital manifestation of your organization. And this is something that I think we're really coming to terms with at our university in terms of evangelizing what the web is. A lot of times um, people feel from the brand or from the touch points with your organization that it's, it's, uh, the human interaction that defines your brand, phone calls, meetings, those types of things. But ultimately, when we look at research um, around student engagement, student enrollment, recruitment, uh, there's a survey, uh, I can't remember, it's the e-expectation survey, Noel Levitz has gone out and said that, you know, what is students, what's their behavior for shopping for a school? And based on the web presence alone, I think 46% of them said, you know, I wouldn't attend this school because of quality or content or something that inhibited their recruitment cycle. So 
you know, looking at the web presence as this two world, you've got your bricks and mortar world, and then you've got your website, and it really is the digital manifestation of your organization. So if you have dysfunction in your organization and you have uh, multiple redundant content areas or you have uh, a content strategy that really is ad hoc or ad lib, that not only shows on the website, but it, it draws to the, what people feel about your corporation or, or your school as a whole. Um, the truth number three I wanted to point out, decision making must be based on expertise, not power. Good luck, right? Are you familiar with this idea? That sounds pretty uh, pie in the sky to me because in a large organization, most large organizations are politically driven. And so how do we get decisions to be based simply on expertise and not perceived expertise? And so are you familiar with this idea of a hippo, the highest paid person's opinion? Oftentimes, in large organizations, hippos drive the world and becomes a zoo. And, and you know, as long as, as someone based on the org chart magically inherited information architecture skills, usability audits, graphic design knowledge, uh, and it's simply because of their pay status and not any real actual credential. So what we need to do is examine that and look at a model that gives an equal playing field to people with expertise, subject matter experts, um, and, and help that get back to reality and, and not worry about um, the hippos in the room. And so when I say hippos, I, I, say, I, I say it pretty fondly, but the, we have a saying in my office, and it's data kills hippos. And I'll get to that. It's, we often, uh, when hippos are in the room, they often tend to say, I think, or I feel, or I want. And the only, uh, the only statement that I'll accept in a meeting is, I know. Not I think, not I feel, or I want. Or the data supports, I infer, you know. We want to get to um, some actual meat to, to validate some of the decisions that we make. Otherwise, uh, quality suffers. Um, the web is an asset, truth number six. This is one I, I certainly uh, feel that uh, senior leaders need to embrace. Often senior leadership sees the web as a cost center and not a strategic asset. But when you look at the transactions that happen online and the power and the reach of, of the web in general, um, realizing that that is a high return on investment, getting, uh, getting that thought switch from a, simply a cost center or sunk cost to a full a strategic um, alignment tool is huge. And we'll talk a little bit on how to do that. Uh, I'm going to certainly not go through these too much. You can download this uh, book and, and go through it. She expands upon all of the truths as, as you go through. Um, but the biggest one I'm focusing on for this talk is truth number five, and that is standards enable collaboration. And so when we look at governance, we think of governance as handcuffs, right? Rules. Here's what you can do. Here's a policy. Here's a guideline. Here's a standard. And you can't stray from it. And a policy is only a policy if it can be enforced. Right? And there's consequences for not following that. Uh, and when we look at and flip that around, we look at standards as uh, being bodies of information that you can take as a third party. So if you have an internal web team or something, you can now go ahead and hire a third party because you've gone ahead and defined your standards um, for development. For example, our choice of using Drupal at the University of Lethbridge has locked out a lot of opportunities to work with third-party companies because in our center of the world, and one of the reasons we started Drupal Camp Lethbridge or Drupal Camp Alberta was simply we didn't have a network of other Drupal developers to even hire. You know, in a city of 80,000, not looking at a lot of specialization going on. Um, but if we had defined a standard uh, for everything that we had done, we would open the door uh, to collaboration. And the beautiful thing about standards enabling collaboration is that when you have other resources working on projects to a quality standard, you inherit those projects to maintain them afterwards. And so that's the, that's the flip side to that piece is that, you know, if you go ahead and define all those standards up front, you're going to have something that's maintainable as if it was built by your own team. Uh, organization owns the web presence. I guess that's important. In the age of CMS, which is not new by any means, this idea of the organization taking ownership of the web presence, this is talking about content strategy and realizing that the web team can go ahead and create structures for the web, but they cannot control 
the content that you fill within that structure. And so the things like SEO and taxonomy and um, just base content strategy pieces, uh, editorial calendars, content life cycles, uh, message brand and tone templates, all of these things belong to the subject matter expertise or the writers that actually fill those pages. And so when we uh, look from the senior admin level and realize that the organization itself is as accountable as the web team for the success of that particular project, then we start to make progress. So I want to talk a little bit about some governance models. So um, I'm not going to dwell on these for too long, but basically as we scale along, we can see that uh, the very loose model is just you know, a dispersed model of distributed resources, uh, resources and decision making. Uh, second, we would get all of those resources but align them with some sort of steering committee. Um, or we'd get a nucleus approach, which is a small central team uh, managing policy and oversights and coordinating resources, but providing specialized staff. And then it keeps getting more and more integrated to a satellite or halo view where you know a central team does everything and it's almost an empire. Um, this is not a collaborative approach by any means, but it's certainly some of the some of the models that we have for for governance or setting up web teams. One thing that is not in this slide, but is certainly uh, a model, is complete chaos and anarchy, and that's the usual state, uh, at least for many schools. And that is a functional model because decisions are getting made, oftentimes three times over, and at what cost. But some decisions are getting made or overturned by another level of management, but stuff's going on. And that's something that, that counts. So when we look at a governance framework, we're, we're talking about involving three uh, levels of people. We're talking about a policy setting body, which is strategically focused leaders, standard setting groups, which web subject matter experts are in the room for, and content owners, which are the program and, and business line managers. When we include all of these people in a governance framework, we're going to get some results. I'm going to talk about that. So the model that we're looking at at the University of Lethbridge, I should also mention that the reason I'm talking web governance today is we've, my team has been tasked to define what model our university will use, and we're finalizing that process now. So my intent in showing you uh, the research that I've looked at, at for Mark Greenfield or Lisa Welshman contained in these slides is simply to share some of the things and the thoughts that we've been doing, um, but not to by any means say that we're an authority on web governance and that you should model what the University of Lethbridge is using. We're just going through this process ourselves and are interested in the dialogue, uh, especially if at the end of this particular session, if you want to talk about uh, any new ideas, I'd love to, love to bounce that off. But the model that we're looking at exploring is one that is um, put forth by Lisa Welshman, and that is the idea of strategy, execution, or strategy governance, execution, and measurement. And when we first started looking at a governance model, we were only looking at a committee, right? It's a school, of course, we're gonna be looking at a committee. We have committees that decide about who's gonna be on the committee. It's just the nature of the beast. So uh, we were looking at just simply what the structure would be uh, to make decisions on the web for the university. And the issue with that is it, because it needs to be so inclusive, it became really watered down, right? You include everyone from every school, from every practice, and you expect our calendars all to get in one room and to hash out something like what should be our link style in our style sheet. It, it sounds absurd, but that's really the direction we were going. So we said, hold on, wait a second, let's wrap this around some other things. So we said, okay, if we've got the governance or the committee structure figured out, why don't we take a look, look one level higher and talk about strategy. Let's look at the senior level. Then we'll look at governance, which is that functional piece. We'll look at execution and how any of the stuff's gonna get, gonna get done. And we'll look at measurement to keep things accountable. It really is the Wild West at the university that I work at right now. And I'm gonna talk about in the measurement side of how this discussion has launched other projects. And one of those projects was a complete overhaul of our analytics and metrics. So. Uh, in January of this year, we completely overhauled all of our Google Analytics piece. We, we found out that we created every instance of Drupal had its own Google Analytics ID. And so that's a problem because when you're looking at the whole, all you're seeing are slivers of data, right? And that's happened and gone on for six years. 
So historically, we never had the complete picture. So then when we started to audit our web strategy internally and taking a look at the decisions we need if we're going to kill some hippos and throw some data out there, we simply didn't have it. We didn't have that cohesive view of all of our web properties. So start, starting at the web strategy side of strategy governance, execution, and measurement. When I'm talking strategy here, I'm not talking external web strategy. I'm not talking a SWOT analysis or a competitive strategy for the web. I'm talking about getting a strategy together internally to deal with how we're going to define who works with what, who builds what, who's accountable to who, and just getting an internal strategy for web development. And so it's important to understand that, that distinction. I'm not talking about a content strategy, an information architecture strategy. I'm not talking about any of that. I'm simply talking about a strategy for internally focused development. And so with that, this definition of a web strategy is the translation of organizational objectives and values into high-level management directions, uh, directives for the web. And so the idea here is to take senior leaders, senior administrations, VPs, and say, we realize you understand the potential of the web, but you don't speak our language. And so they're saying the same thing, is we realize you understand the business side of our organization, but you don't speak our language. You come to us and you speak about CMSs and optimizations and infrastructure. And what you really need to do to, to level the playing field is talk to us about risk, liability, return and start talking about the business focus. What is the business case for things? So as soon as you can start flipping um, the needs of the web to the way the senior admin uh, speak, results just tend to happen. And we already had some great success with uh, just bringing in that idea of Google Analytics. If you come in and show that hard data and show what we did is we visualized the recruitment funnel for our school. And we said, here is the referral traffic coming in from organic search, direct search. Here's the referral traffic coming in from paid search. And here's the funnel right down to a transaction. For us, it's application. For a large business, it might be conversion of some other goal, whether it be a sign up or a, a purchase of, of something, et cetera. And so when we were able to show how that conversion funnel worked and where the failure points were, suddenly, you can examine funding for some of our promotional efforts and campaigns and say, hey, there's no real return for this. And we've been operating for years without knowing what the return of the magical internet might be. But now that we can visualize that, we got senior admin and the web team coming together and looking at things uh, in an intelligent fashion. So the idea here is that Working with senior administration, if we can get guiding principles, which are simply the attitude for the organization for the web, you know, describing how the organization will use the web to support the organization's core values and business objectives. So the VPs or senior admin have a great <coughs> understanding of the five-year plan for the business or school or what might have you. You might see that trickle down into a communicated strategic plan, but that strategic plan tends to be so nebulous or so open that it doesn't apply to the web. We're talking specific guiding principles for how the organization will use the web. For example, for our school, it will be the web will be our primary vehicle for recruitment and retention and speaking to the community. That guiding principle in itself already allows us to shape projects, priority, directives. And coming from senior admin, we can map back to that in all of the flavors of projects that we do. So that's the first thing in, in starting a web governance framework, is getting a guiding principle articulated and documented. Oftentimes we have um, these things floating around, but because we have no central communication point, or we have um, just a simple lack of documentation, getting the documentation on, on all of this stuff is key. Documentation, dissemination, measurement. Um, the second piece is formalization of authority, and this is a tough one, you know, and it just ensures who is responsible or can make decisions about governance, execution, and measurement, but getting them clearly articulated allows them to be properly resourced. So one of the things I want to talk about in this talk is a pretty classic uh, discussion, it's a de debate, and it's, it's debate as bad as Joomla, Drupal, or Mac PC, and I don't want to get into it at all here, but I do want to touch on it. It's that idea of where should a web team fit, under IT or under communications or by itself. And so 
this is where that would be decided, that formalization of authority. That, that comes down to your org structure, and I'm going to touch on that in a bit. So, if you look at the strategic point, you've got guiding principles, you've got the formalization of authority. Uh, there's a third part that I haven't mentioned in my slide, equally important, establishing metrics, key performance indicators for success. So if we understand that the key performance indicators come and align with the strategic plan of the business, you've got the, the direction of the business, the direction of the web in tandem, in sync, in concert, whatever you want to use. Um, and, and with that, you've got the metrics that senior administration care about. So you can align your stuff to that. So uh, defining those KPIs uh, for our school, it might be web transactions for application um, will increase X over um, this next reporting period. Getting down to that level of detail for KPIs allows us to align our projects and efforts to ensure that that metric happens. And those are smart objectives. Those are smart objectives. Sus sustainable, measurable, actionable. I can't remember. Anyone know smart objectives? What it means? I could make it up. It's a, maybe it's a Canadian thing. Thank you. Attainable? Yeah. Love it. Yes. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm all about it. Thank you so much. It didn't escape me. Um, but really, when it comes down to governance, and this is that structure, it's the implementation of web governance framework, establishment of web policy, and the codification, implementation, and enforcement of web standards. So when we look at the way the web has evolved in a business um, sort of lens, you can see that uh, traditional practices like accounting, HR, well, so finance, legal, accounting, any of the established practices, they have mature governance because they didn't sort of start with the central webmaster who kind of exploded into, you know, I write the content, I design the pages, I put out the links, and I'm a one-man show to now, oh, I work with a decentralized team or I run a team of 12 and I'm worried about infrastructure, purchasing decisions, software, like the, the maturity and the, the growth and the evolution of that role didn't keep pace with any of the governance. So it's a little bit of organic growth, it's a little bit of Wild West, and uh, a governance framework will help kind of take what's already established in practice, say like HR policies and things, and bring them to the web, which is just a natural evolution of putting business thought to something that is not necessarily managed. Now the beauty of that organic growth is because it hasn't had uh, sort of that governance piece, it's the, the speed has accelerated because there hasn't been that business dragging it down. But it's time to say enough is enough. We've got ways to, uh, to make, and to not stifle innovation, but ensure quality. So the vehicle we're looking at at the University of Lethbridge is something we're calling a digital council, which is simply a small expert-led group of subject matter expertise um, to do job one. And that job one I alluded to earlier in this talk, and that is defining standards, policies, and guidelines for people to collaborate against. Because uh, internally on my team, we have development standards, certainly we have coding standards, we have graphic design standards for marketing, but we haven't gone ahead and thought about if you weren't on my team, what would you need to know? What are all the things you just know inherently by, by doing web work at the university every day? And so we've said that with a small uh, body of subject matter experts, given authority by senior administration, uh, in a 12 to 18 month process, we're going to go ahead and uh, query the community and the subject matter experts that are available to define, disseminate, implement, and measure standards and guidelines. Unless I didn't say policy here, because policy, it's a little different. You need to take a, an audit of existing policies, maybe HR. How does the web relate to HR? Well, certainly it affects some policies around social media, right? What can you say, what can you not say, those types of things. Um, we take a look at the impact of the web on a lot of the mature side of things, and we realize we need an audit. Maybe it's a privacy policy. Maybe it's, it's some things. We need to audit and see what's out there. And that happens not with web expertise. Certainly it does as 
um, a support to that process. But policy happens more with the uh, small consulted web expertise and the subject matter experts around legal finance, HR, et cetera, and senior admin. Um, that's just because the policies are enforceable. And while standards are enforceable, policies have a consequence if you don't follow them. So uh, we are looking at this digital council for this process to document all of the standards and guidelines for development to enable collaboration. So what happens in our university and in other organizations is uh, people get stuck in silos. So if you're stuck in communications, you're stuck there forevermore. If you're stuck in facilities, but you might have web expertise, we don't care. If you're stuck in our curriculum development center, but you have exp web expertise, we don't care. And we look at um, fiscal constraint and we look at the uh, financial shape that everyone's in right now and we go, hey, wait a minute. We've got resources in this university that are stagnant, that have the expertise to help us out. But because we have no est established governance or standards in place, we can't utilize them on projects because obviously they report to another line manager and they have, uh, their department has other priorities. But if you have an overarching web governance piece, you can now start to break down those silos and work against a common standard to build something great and expand your resourcing. So we've been able to do that where I work uh, with our registrar's office. We have only a capacity of five designers and developers. They came to us and said, hey, we really need to jump the queue for our project. And we said, we have no resources at all. They hired some grad students to build over the summer their Drupal piece of the pie, but they came and reported back to the web team to find out what those standards were, just to ensure that we aligned the development because we know that when those summer students just go back to school, they're not gonna care about what they built, but we're gonna inherit that stuff. So we wanted to make sure we had a, a great um, sort of participatory piece through that process. And that's worked out really well. We've been able to expand our resources, you know, literally um, probably by, by half for our summer cycle. Uh, just with being able to collaborate against the standards. So we're already seeing, because we don't have that as a formal process yet, the ad hoc process is giving us really good feedback. So we're just anxious to get all that down on paper. Uh, and we're looking at this digital council, not only for the web, but other immature channels as well. So social, mobile, all come together for this digital council to get the standards and, pol or standards and guidelines in place. So, any questions so far? Is okay in terms of speed? We're all right? Okay, so when we look at standards and guidelines, um, we can't work in isolation because one of the things, and I'll allude to this, or I already alluded to this, but we'll talk about it more, is web is simply different than IT and communications roles. Uh, and when we look at all the types of standards we need to inventory to define, we've got a communication or non-technical focus on the left, non-communication technical focus on the right. And we go, we run the gamut from design all the way to server infrastructure. And so we're gonna need uh, cross cut across silos to define these standards. So communications will have to work uh, with IT to define you know, the brand, the tone, the message, um, the content templates, the content strategy. Uh, you, you need that from multiple subject matter expertise. And so this graphic is just simply to illustrate that working in isolation, the web team is going to have an incomplete picture of what the web could be and vice versa, uh, just through the nature of, of what their mandate is. So when it comes to uh, developing standards, there uh, is this life cycle around standards and that if we look at external forces of policy, technology changes, new best practices, that puts some external forces on taking a look at that standards uh, definition. And then internally, policy and new projects and initiatives. For example, uh, one of the things we're doing right now is we're converting all our websites to mobile compatibility. And that involves on the technical scale, the removal of Adobe Flash products for everything that we have. Um, and so that's an internal uh, driver to change. And that goes ahead and, and it changes all of our standards that we've already defined around multimedia and rich media and those types of things. So that's how this life cycle works. Define, disseminate, implement, and measure. So that measurement part might be the analytics saying, hey, people aren't being able to see our Flash content. Oh, it's because they're using iPads. 
oh, iPads are a big deal in education. We need to think about this. Let's redefine our standard. So, um, I can get into this. I'm not sure how interested you are as a group, but I'm gonna I'll, I'll gloss over it and come back if we need to. Basically, uh, I went into all those phases: uh, define, disseminate, accept, implement, and measure, and talked about who would be involved, what the processes were, and what tools you might use. So I can leave these for the slides afterwards. But um, the point here is that. For the definition, I already made mention of this, we have a cross-functional team of business stakeholders, web experts, communications, IT, and then functional experts. And that functional expertise is important and often gets dropped out of the equation. When we look at defining a web team, uh, oftentimes people forget, they, they think web, CMS, code, design, but forget about the human factors, what about UX, usability, testing, and when you look at um, marketing as a piece, you say, oh, okay, uh, marketing has a very slivered view of the web. It's uh, a broadcast vehicle. It tends to be a monologue and not a conversation. And so when you look at application development and UX and all those other things, we need other people, human factors people, in the mix. So uh, one of the departments in our university is library science. I would love to help them, or for them to help us develop a taxonomy for our institution. Because guess what they love to do all day? And they're getting paid to do it anyway. You know, this is this realization of we've got resources all through our institution that we're just not leveraging. Because we're not talking, we're in silos, or it's, it's just a, kind of a mess. Um, but the idea here is they provide input, we articulate and document that, and then there's an approval process. And we can do that through an intranet or wiki some sort of collaboration software and knowledge management. So that's the definition part. Uh, disseminate is getting the web execution teams in the mix, communication staff, trainers, site owners, and managers, just getting that message out there. Once we've gone ahead and defined, codified, approved what that standard should be, we've got to get out there. Formally, we would create style guides, FAQs. We would create publications. Uh, we do a lot of training. It's an institution. There's labs available. It's kind of a, a nice thing about being in a school. Um, but also uh, supporting tools would be intranet, wiki, and email. Implementation. This is interesting because oftentimes we don't always think about process around user permissions, workflows, quality controls, content life cycles. Um, and we really need to do that through a CMS like Drupal. Yeah, see how I'm tying it in? We're not just the business side of things. A search or taxonomy um, management. Measure, this is my, my favorite one because uh, this is my pet project at the university was getting the analytics revised. And uh, if you're interested or have the same problem, I assume you don't. I assume we were just kind of silly about how we looked at our Google Analytics stuff. But we looked to uh, University of Nebraska Lincoln. There's a guy named Seth Miranda there, and he's gone ahead and he's their uh, user experience architect, and he's in charge of their analytics. And his model was that they still have each central website uh, reporting to its own mm -hmm. Google Analytics ID. This is just an aside, by the way. But they have a master Google Analytics, Analytics ID that each site reports twice. They report to the site owner, and then they report to a larger institutional collective so they can get the bigger picture. So that model really worked well for us. We never thought of it at the time. It's one of those dull moments, but we're getting good data out of it now. Uh, so web execution teams, uh, site owners and managers, just get training on how to audit. Um, and not just analytics. We're talking about usability studies, survey, surveys, focus groups, uh, getting that sort of qualitative data as well as the quantitative data. So, if, a uh, show of hands if you know Jeffrey Zeldman, you've heard of his work, Zeldman, web standards guy, he's open, rah rah, list apart. Uh, if you take a look at his stuff, he wrote this great article, it was in 2007, called Let There Be Web Divisions, which really talks about that split between IT and communications in terms of who reports to who. And so my favorite quote, let the coders, designers, writers, and others charged with creating and maintaining your web presence work together. Put them in a division that recognizes your site is not a bastard of your brochures, nor a natural outgrowth of your group calendar. Pretty harsh, but 
it tends to uh, really articulate the problems that when we put web teams within IT, we think like IT, we think like a process, we think um, tools and technology, we don't, and, and zeros and ones and technical requirements and uh, those types of things. When we look at communications, uh, we look at messaging, brand, campaigns, and we forget all about applications and infrastructure and those types of things. So uh, I made the mention of this before that, that there's this whole sort of gap between technology and the marketing side of things, and that is the user. And that user experience thing doesn't really reside well or bode with either marketing, maybe more so marketing, but certainly not with IT, at least our IT department. So um, in my university where I work, uh, we report to IT. And so this is probably why I, I feel a little strongly about it. I don't feel we're as effective as we could be, but in our maturity model from our organization, it's not going to be any other way. We have to work within that structure. So what have we done? I've got a really great relationship with our communications manager. And, and so I'm able to drop in at her office and just have ad hoc meetings, say, hey, what are you working on? And, you know, I have a weekly one-on-one -on -one meeting with her that we just talk about what's going on in each unit and sort of what our challenges are. And so we have this ad hoc handshake relationship that says we're going to work more closely together. So she's allowed to audit our content and provide some writing expertise. And we've agreed to align uh, more closely to the communications needs for web. And it's working out really well. But because it's not on paper, it's just... It, as, as soon as I get hit by a bus or she gets hit by a bus, that's gone and those relationships can change. So uh, getting it formalized would be great. Are those relationships accepted by the, if we're talking about hippos, people, are they accepted by the Okay, so I use hippo here. I don't use hippo at work. Understood. Yeah. Um, we just talk data. And you know what? They are. Um, we are... So 2013 is the end of our five-year strategic plan, and we refresh that strategic plan for the institution. And one of the big drivers from the early thought for our new strategy talks all about collaboration. And so we're towing the line before the line was even drawn. So it's great. It actually aligns really well. So we've talked strategy. We've talked um, governance. Now we're talking execution in terms of uh, what that model might look like. And in, in a world where uh, the web teams don't necessarily report to IT or communications, there's this idea of the web execution atom, and that is central to web operations management. This model, uh, I think, aligns with a web operations manager who reports to senior administration in line with IT and communications, and that is its own entity. And I don't see that happening anytime soon, but it's certainly in an ideal world, if you could, if you could describe what web operations management might look like. Uh, this is a program and product focused uh, model. So web KPIs and standards are central to this particular model. And then program, business process, compliance, communications, project management, uh, and then product content strategy, graphic design, social, all circle around that nucleus of web KPIs and standards. So that's the quality uh, standard, and that's the accountability piece for all projects. So in this model, you might have a web operations manager who takes direction from senior admin on what those projects might need from a priority or direction, and then pulls resources from the institution to collaborate and, and come into project focus groups depending on what's needed. If it's a mobile app, people are pulled from IT, people are pulled from uh, communications, etc. It's not looking at uh, the silos anymore, and it's looking at an overarching resource piece. So uh, this would be, if my ideal web team, I certainly don't have all of these roles. Show of hands if you have a community manager in your business for social media. Show of hands if you need one. Yeah. We have a lot of good hits on social media, but we have it on the side of someone's desk. We don't have it as a defined role. So I think the opportunity is really being lost with engagement for our key roles, which are alumni and recruitment. We really need to formalize that. But the idea is that you have a web operations manager, you have a team lead, and then you have different roles accounting for all the, the spectrum of uh, roles within a web, which is technical content, design, 
UX, which is something we're absolutely looking to focus on a lot better uh, where I work, uh, production and social media. So measurement. Uh, I spoke a lot about this already, but the establishment early on by senior admin of key performance indicators, uh, keeping projects accountable to those. Uh, oftentimes in education, people who get the funding are people who do the work and how you get the funding might be not a process that is as defined. But uh, if you have KPIs for, uh, and are, accountability to, are you accountable to the success of your project? And that success says you won't get funded a second time if you're not being strategically aligned or, or going ahead and being accountable to what senior admin uh, feels is a success factor. Then that kind of keeps those projects, those rogue projects aligned. Um, and of course, user testing analytics helps us just sort of do an audit and see if all of this stuff is working together. So that's it for my canned stuff. And I wanted to leave it into an open conversation uh, just about governance. And so what kind of challenges do you have currently? Uh, what do you see in what I've talked about that might be full of holes? What's working? Yeah. My company is working with a, a, a public media uh, broadcaster, which is a joint affiliate. So they've got their uh, the radio broadcast, they've got their TV broadcast, uh, and they're just running around as, as messy as any organization or computer I'm dealing with. Um, and so there are very much so the siloing on all of this. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's somewhat of a, a unique challenge. It doesn't seem, it seems like a lot of this is principle, but they just want to yeah, yeah. It's as dysfunctional as the rest of them. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I think the key is to recognize there's an issue and then have senior administration. Engaging senior administration is really, it, everything, like I said, becomes a symptom or bottom up. And it really needs to be top down. And speaking that language of business and understanding what the return and the risk of not doing something and not talking about a version of a product and how that's going to solve things, but how a process or a multi-step process is now coming down to, to two or, you know what I mean, just those um, efficiency, optimization, uh, mitigating risk, uh, use that to, to get an open door with senior admin, and that's where the conversations really start. Yep. I appreciate the, uh, your entire presentation. Thank you. Thank you. We were meeting with the IT manager, yeah. and we were meeting with the director of marketing. Yep. Uh, and um, it was interesting the way the conversation kind of flowed, and what it came down to, well, not there wasn't a single thing, but uh, clearly um, there's the priority of having to uh, honor the, the fact that you know they need to bring in revenue in order to bankroll all these things. Yep. And, it wasn't so much that they wanted to simply improve these processes over here, but you know, let's let's be straightforward. If if, if, if they can pitch it and make this the uh, uh, pitch the proposal to the person who's most interested in the money, yep. And if they can bring in KPI, you know, define yep. KPI yep. and demonstrate that, yep. then that's going to just bankroll a whole lot and, and loosen loosen everything. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, I mean, th that's just a simple example of how yeah. Yep. They need to I yep. love how you've articulated, you know, it's, let's, let's, let's make a web of this. Yeah. Or at least as, have that yeah. intent that we're going to bring these two together yep. to collaborate. Even if in the org chart you're not, if there's some sort of agreement to work collaboratively and recognize that those resources are maybe outside of your division. And that's also not only internally but externally as well. And I think the, uh, the apprehensiveness around working with a contractor oftentimes internally is, well, what if uh, what we get is beyond our scope of knowledge to maintain? Or what if it's completely opposite? What if it's garbage? You know, we need a quality standard, uh, not only to define a technology, but the approach and the methodology for maintenance. Mm -hmm. Any other? Yeah, hi. Um, I guess I wonder, like, how many, um, I guess, proposals or business? Um, um, Such a derogatory term. Like, but yeah. Like, you know, come and um, articulate. Needs and like 
when does it become like too many of those being a part of the web governance team that, you know, um, and then the experts being so limited in number. Right. That you, yeah. Right. There's a tipping point, right? A yeah, political tipping point. Balance. So I, I think you start like we did. I think that's exactly what happened was when we first defined what the governance framework was going to look like, we simply talked about a committee, and that committee was full of hippos. And so, uh, like I mentioned, the intent of what was being tabled with at a hippo meeting is simply um, brain exercise or it's uh, not a whole lot of productivity going on, and it's watering down the goals of, of what the, uh, that committee is meeting about. So um, engaging senior admin to understand with authority and delegation for subject matter expertise to comprise that committee or council is really what the win is. The idea is to completely remove the hippos and say, you will be consulted because we need broad institutional input. We need to look at the big picture. Certainly, as we look at senior admin, and we say, you know the strategic direction of the institution, invaluable to set the direction of our projects. We certainly don't discount the input. We just want the input to remain where people's expertise lies. And so, if you don't have, a, if you don't have internal expertise, you might look at consultants to come in and just come down to help you define those standards because it is a term project, right? We said 12 to 18 months, it would just go into that life cycle of standards revision once things were finally uh, brought to light and documented. So to answer your question, I don't know in terms of a hippo to subject matter ratio, but if, if I had my say in a perfect world, there would be none. It would be one to zero, right? And that's not, that's not in reality. But we, we take a look at the slide. I talked about a composition for definition. And so we've said web expertise, communications IT, and then functional experts. So we're keeping out, in the academic world, we're probably keeping out deans and, and certainly um, people that, uh, there's this discussion around ownership of the web too, and we'll get that another, another time, we'll talk about that another time, but uh, we want the people to be focused and given authority to make those decisions, but they have to be a subject matter expert, or at least somewhat uh, learned to, or um, to be able to participate in some fashion, and not to just exercise their jobs. That's a tough sell, right? Because in organizational structure, people have a position of prestige, and they are there because of their credentials. Uh, the, 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 I guess the translation here is trying to understand what, what the scope of their input is, and, but not to, uh, not to offend. And that's the hard part, right? That's the hard part. Yeah. I guess, in what, um, I guess where should like, decisions be made in terms of like, what committees? Like, I struggle right now with our own, like, we have a, a web governance like a steering committee steering or something? Committee, yeah. And then we have um, a marketing communications team. And marketing mm -hmm. communications team has the budget. Yeah. Therefore, they're the ones trying, yeah. to, trying to make the That kind of decisions. goes with that other so conversation, the funding. The steering committee kind of just advises that other one, and they get to yeah. determine what gets spent. Well, that's because there hasn't been an overarching view around a decision of who has authority and, and where those inputs come and who executes. That was step one, right? And that comes from senior administration. So it sounds like um, things are in reality controlled by funding. And so the KPIs that we talked about uh, help alleviate the second mistake and keep people accountable for their expenditures to make sure they're on brand, on message, on strategy. Um, but in terms of that balance of power of we have the funding and you have the knowledge, you really need to fight back with this overarching framework first. And the only way you can really do that uh, is, is just getting that senior administration buy-in of subject matter expertise, not power. Remember that digital DECA? Remember that I showed you the pages of Lisa Welshman's piece? You know, that's a tough one. Truth number three, decision-making must be based on expertise, not power. And these are sort of the hard pills to swallow for management, but if you, can, if, if you can get these through in the correct way, in business language, appropriate to your business, these will be the breakthroughs. I don't know is the easy answer. 
I yeah. Like, I, I want to add when, when it comes to um, you know if 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 you are both championing the same vision. Yeah. Uh, and even if they talk an attitude about well, I've got I've got the first string, so you should listen to me. Um, if you I believe that as 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 purposes, if you own it enough, and you say, look, I know this is what you're trying to accomplish, and in fact, I'm going to invest the time and energy to learn your language, talk to you so that you know I understand you, and demonstrate slowly at first, but growing, that what I'm capable of doing in implementing all of this technology is going to serve your purpose, then they're going to find it because they're going to see that you're actually doing it. And, and, it, and it does take some, some building of trust. And uh, it may take me as an expert learning how to talk to them first, rather than them learning how to talk to me first. But in doing that, that engages them. They see the commitment. You start having a more vibrant dialogue. And if you can't get that overarching key stakeholder or, or you know, key, key personnel to just mandate, then at least you can start building the bridges anyway uh, so that you have the vibration. And it may mean that you go first, that you be more collaborative than them first so that you can start the time. We're out of time. I appreciate it. We appreciate your time. Thank you for coming. If you want to chat further, I'll be sticking around for another 10 minutes or so. But uh, thanks so much for your time. It really helps when we get a participatory process going. <laughs>